this is the first time I've presented this. This is actually some data and a bunch of speculations. I warned that in advance. Uh, okay, so, so weather. What are some of the questions that we start with with weather? Uh, well, the first one, which I actually show often, is you have a single cloud up there, and, and the water is evaporating. And so how come there's only one cloud when there should be a vast cloud that covers the in entire surface? What's the explanation? Another one, what keeps the clouds afloat? What's inside of clouds? It's water, droplets of water. Now, if I take a droplet of water and drop it, it goes down. It doesn't stay up. So what keeps the cloud up? Um, and why do dark clouds sometimes produce rain? We live in Seattle. We, we see dark clouds all the time. We can't tell if it's going to let loose and, and unleash the rain or not. Okay, so uh, this is an unconventional approach, and it starts from the book that Igor mentioned. And by the way, I'm going to show you some clips from the movie, The Fourth Phase, in a few minutes. Um, and uh, believe it or not... Uh, uh, <laughs> And so I just want to start by reviewing a few of the essentials that come out of the book in order to prepare for what I want to talk about, because if easy water is all around us, it may, must play some role in weather. And the question is, well, what's the role? So the idea is that you have a hydrophilic material sitting next to water. And out of that water, uh, when you have light, uh, particularly infrared light, the water molecules split into the positive and negative components. And the negative components form these easy layers, these hexagonal layers, which then stack on, on one another. And they keep building and building, depending on how much light energy is available. And the structure of, of this honeycomb <coughs> looks something like this. And uh, th these are the oxygens, and these are the hydrogens in between. And if you count the number in a, any unit cell, it turns out it's not H2O, it's actually H3O2. And um, if it were H2O, it wouldn't be negatively charged. But we know from experiments that this is typically negatively charged. And, and, and where are the corresponding positive charges that come from the water? Well, they're sitting in here. So you have negative here and you have positive here, which basically means that you've got a charged battery in water. A hydrophilic surface, negatively charged fourth phase or EZ, and positive charges here. So, so what we see is potential energy. We have separated uh, positive and negative charges. And the question I raise based on, uh, on this is, how does this impact, uh, or this, how does this potential energy play into weather? Okay, so we start with the weather cycle. This is from the U.S. Geographical Society. And uh, you can see it running around here, and we might start at the left side where we have ice and snow. And the ice and snow uh, come down and melt, and gradually, uh, during uh, snow melt, uh, the melted water eventually finds its way into the ocean, and you have a lot of evaporation that's occurring here. And eventually, the evaporated water condenses uh, into clouds, and it keeps going in, in this direction. And uh, then, finally, we get, again, precipitation. And so, what I'd like to do is to go through these stages, and I think there'll be a, a few surprises, and and consider how what we've learned about easy water might impact our understanding of each one of these and, and how that can then come together to explain a few of the essential features of weather, which we really don't understand. So, so what I want to go through is first talk about water and ice, how water can transition into ice and vice versa. Then I want to talk about evaporation and then condensation of the humidity in, into clouds, precipitation, and of course wind, which comes usually with, with precipitation, sometimes not, and then some of the exotic kinds of weather that we often fear. So let's talk about water and ice to, uh, to start with. Um, and the reason for discussing it is that we have evidence that water doesn't actually transition directly into ice, but water transitions into EZ, which then transitions in, into ice. And, and when the ice melts, uh, it's the opposite. The ice transitions into EZ water, which then transitions into, into H2O. So this is the structure of ice. 
And I tell you that ice is not usually red. But, uh, so the red ones are oxygens. And in between the two oxygens are hydrogens, which are just omitted from, uh, from this diagram to keep it, keep it simple and clear. But they would be here, here, and here, and, and so on would be the hydrogens. So you notice that the ice structure is hexagonal. It's uh, hexagonal sheets. And these sheets are actually held together by protons, and you can see them here. This is the same structure as this, the same ice structure, but it's viewed from a different angle. So uh, you, you lose the hexagonal uh, sense by looking at this angle, but you gain a sense of these uh, blue dots. So, so ice is really red and blue, so to speak. And, and these blue dots are protons, and so these positive protons glue together the negative oxygens, and that's why ice is hard. So what about transition from ice to EZ? Well, in order to, to um, uh, transition to EZ water, which is negatively charged, ice is neutral, uh, the, the obvious way is to remove the protons. So you just pull out these little uh, blue dots here. Uh, and then you have negative charge, and it's hexagonal, just, just like EZ water. And there's one more step that's required to go from ice to EZ, and that is... Um, a shifting of planes, and it's shown here. So you have two of the many planes, many honeycomb uh, uh, structures. And the reason why we think this is the correct structure is because it sticks together. So if you go back to this one, if you pull out the protons, then you have negative oxygen next to negative oxygen. They repel each other, and the whole structure flies apart. And that's not cool. Uh, so, however... If you do this slide of half of the oxygen-oxygen distance, then something nice happens. Uh, you get the negative oxygen next to the positive hydrogen, and, and so they stick together electrostatically. Uh, so this is stable. So, so that's going from ice uh, to EZ. And the reverse, as you can imagine, is it just very simple. You start with the EZ structure, which, remember, this hexagon is shifted to the right compared to this one and you have a kind of um, electrostatic glue that sticks the planes together to one another. And then you simply add protons and then shift it back to the situation where the planes, the hexagons are back in register. So, so the idea that comes out of, out of all of this, and again, is discussed a lot more in, in the book, is that if you want to freeze water, you have to go through this easy or fourth phase uh, structure in order to get to ice. And these two structures, as I said, they're very similar to one another, and uh, you just basically add protons to this one, and you, you uh, get the ice, which is neutral, and this is negatively charged. So I want to show you some evidence to, to point to this, to what I've just told you. Um, is the easy really necessary to convert water in, into ice? And uh, the experiment, or one of several experiments, looks like this. You take a piece of naphion, which was discussed earlier in the day, sitting next to a droplet of water, and this is all on a cooling plate, uh, which begins to lower the temperature. And we know that there's an EZ that's sitting next to uh, naphion, and as it cools, it turns out the EZ tends to grow uh, with, with cooling, and, and ultimately it forms ice. And I'm going to show you um, in the next slide this a picture of this during the formation of ice. So it goes from here to here to here. Now, here is the naphion, and here is the water uh, droplet, and the EZ would be right here between the naphion and the water droplet. So the first, um, <coughs> the first part of the water to freeze is shown right here, and you can see that the freeze um, occurs in the EZ. It may spread out into the water, but it keeps progressing here along where the EZ is. And in the third panel, you can see very clearly it progresses along the EZ. So it appears that the freeze initiates in the EZ, uh, as, as we suggested. And so, so the process that uh, we envision happening is you start with the EZ, and remember, this is negatively charged, and you have protons here. Uh, and with time, as the temperature is lowered, the EZ grows, and you have more protons. And when the proton concentration gets high enough, what happens is that the protons then move 
in, into this to the most negative level, which is right here, and so this level here then turns into ice. And the process continues uh, as this builds more protons, more ice, and, and so on. So that's what the way we think that ice forms from water to easy to ice and involving protons. Now, what about the protons? Um, can, is it really true that the protons rush in during ice formation? So we did an experiment to test that, and the experiment is shown here. So this is a chamber, and this is a cooling plate, um, so, so we can cool the, the water. And it turns out the EZ begins building right next to this uh, cooling plate here, and these are microspheres. We usually use microspheres to indicate the boundary of, of the EZ. But in this case, instead of having microspheres, we replace the microspheres with a dye, and the, the dye is excluded, just like the microspheres. This is a, a pH-sensitive dye. It turns color um, in different pHs, and, and the low pH, uh, which consists of a lot of protons, the dye turns red. And, and so let me show you um, the, the results. So just after cooling, here's the cooling plate down here, um, and this is the water. This is a neutral pH, this color. But you can see uh, this region has turned red. Um, earlier, there was no dye here, but as the, the ice forms, dye comes in, and the red color indicates many protons. So, indeed, it looks as though the formation of ice is associated with an in, inrush of, of protons. So, ice formation involves protons. So, you start with easy, you add protons, and you get ice. And so that's why uh, in, in the scheme, we put the EZ right here in between the water and the ice because uh, when you start cooling to freeze, the first thing that happens is the EZ builds up, and then this EZ with the addition of protons turns into ice. Now, you'd expect the opposite during melting. So you start with, with ice and, and you uh, warm it up so that it melts and you'd expect that the first thing that should happen is you should see easy water and then ordinary water. And the question is, well, is that what you see? Um, and um, does melting produce easy water plus protons? So we did the experiment and what we did is we put some ice in a cuvette and we allowed the ice to melt and we checked the water that surrounded the ice with a spectrometer. And we know that easy water absorbs uh, light at 270 nanometers. So, so these are the absorption spectra, just melted water samples. And these are basically the same. These are just different kinds of water that we used to freeze to show that the result really didn't matter what kind of water you used to begin with. So during the thaw, we, we looked at the just thawed water, and you can see a, a peak here, and the peaks are pretty much the same in each of the samples, and they fall just at 270 nanometers. And then that disappears after a couple of minutes, and the easy water then turns into ordinary water. So this 270 nanometer absorption is a signature of EZ. So from this, we conclude that when you melt ice, you get EZ water, and then you get ordinary H2O. And that may be a, a, side, a side point, is that that may be why glacial melt is considered to be good for health, because you're actually drinking EZ water. Uh, so <coughs> the melting of ice, the ice turns to EZ, and the EZ eventually to H2O. And now I want to show a film. Um, and um, I guess I can click here, and I hope um, that this w works. Whoops. Um, what am I doing wrong? Uh, maybe I need to, um, to click it on here. Whoops. Uh, here we go. Just click it. No. You want to co copy it? Okay. Uh, we'll use th this one. It doesn't matter which. Uh, what it's. Oh, yeah. Not 
not found. Ah, there you go. So just a, by matter of introduction, this is a movie. Um, it's called The Fourth Phase, and it's named after the fourth phase of water. And I was quite surprised. The person who made it, his name is Travis Rice, and some of you will know his name. He's a famous snowboarder. And so the, the movie is on, basically on a snowboarding, and, and he came to our lab, and he shot for two days. And some of that is in the movie, and some of the stuff that's not in the movie comes in this five-minute clip. And so I just wanted to show it to you because, obviously, it means that everything we've ever done is correct. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, what do we do next? What? Oh, connection. Oh, okay. Yeah, that should do it. Uh, okay, that's fine. Sound. That's it. What? Sound. Yeah, it should be sound. Yeah, okay. Oh, and get the yeah. sound from here. Yeah, there you go. Sure. From when I was a kid, I've always been intrigued with water and how we interact with it. Since then, traveling the world snowboarding, the concept for this trip evolved to follow the hydrological cycle around the North Pacific, really attempting to immerse oneself in the elements and see how this whole thing works. It's been incredible. As children, we're all motivated to find the truth. A child looks around and is learning truths all the time we have this natural tendency to explore. I'm Gerald Pollack, and I'm a professor of bioengineering at the University of Washington in Seattle. It, it can be really challenging to, uh, to keep an open mind in these days. Scientists have become more hesitant to challenge perceived truth. Uh, how are you doing, Lee? So it's working? Uh, yeah. There are some books that suggest that essentially we've kind of reached the limit of what there is to know. I'm shocked by this, this uh, perception. There are many aspects of water that we see every day, and we don't really understand them. These are questions that need answers. We all learn that water has three phases, solid state, liquid state and also the vapor state however you can't explain all the known properties of water with three phases alone you need a fourth phase 
what's the fourth phase? With an energetic input, water molecules undergo massive change. They become ordered, they acquire charge. All of this energy to create the order comes from light. We began with experiments to try to learn more. We noticed something that seemed almost magical. Every one of the tests that we did showed that this water was different from ordinary water. The individual molecules were actually linked together to form a hexagon, and then many hexagons. We can understand why snowflakes are hexagonal. They actually form from the fourth phase of water. After some time, there seemed to be enough evidence to indicate that this was a distinctly different phase of water. You might ask what implications it has for us. We're approximately two-thirds water. Most of the water inside of our cells, they're filled with fourth phase water. This could be central to all of what goes on in the biology of the cell. This is going to lead the way to a better understanding of how cells function. I think part of the beauty of the fourth phase, especially as it relates, I guess, to this film, is the concept that not everything is as it appears to be. Leaving some space and open-mindedness for allowance of a shift in perspective on how you view the world is one of the most important things in my life. Being a scientist is, is a search for truth. We somehow need to change the system so that we're looking for ideas whose outcome has the capacity to really shake the earth and create breakthroughs, if not revolutions. You need to dig deeper and deeper in order to find the truth. Thank you. Yeah, this was fun in the making. <laughs> It's, it's actually a, is a, a fantastic movie. You'll see snowboarding that you couldn't imagine possible, uh, the acrobatics, and these guys are still alive to tell, tell the story, uh, which, which is quite amazing. Um, and there are, I really enjoyed meeting these people. They're, they're actually rather modest people uh, compared to what they actually can, can achieve. Um, okay, so... So we talked about water and ice, and I want to talk about evaporation uh, now. And um, you have probably seen uh, a scene just like this. This was taken at Starbucks uh, by my son, who was the artist who, who uh, did the book. And, and one of the things you can see is that it's not, it's not random uh, at all. What actually comes up comes up in a, in a series of puffs that you can see here. And uh, we had one undergraduate student in the lab, and, and the students don't always do what I suggest they do. <laughs> and uh, so this guy um, took a laser beam, uh, is a student, and he passed it through one of those puffs to see what the structure of the puff might look like. And you might think that if you did this and looked from above at this illuminated plane, you might see a kind of an amorphous white-looking mass. And when he showed the result, I almost fell out of my chair because it looks something like this. So, um, the, so this is the rising vapor. And the ri if we look, for example, at, at this, this panel, which is one of this taken randomly, all of the evaporative moisture is in the white part because it scatters light. But in between here, there's nothing. So it's like a pretzel. And, and these pretzels, if you, as they're rising, if you look at successive planes, they look pretty much the same. So they're ordered in, in the vertical direction. So, you know, when I saw this, I said, this is really, really weird. And the first question that arose is, hey, if this is coming from the water, then is there a corresponding structure in the water? Uh, because this just, the, the, these, these, Films were, or videos were taken just immediately above the water, so you figure there might be something underneath. 
And when we looked at it, um, I don't know how good the lighting is. Can you see a pattern inside here or not? Yeah, okay. So it's just warm water sitting there, and you probably never bothered to look to see that you can see the same pattern. And you can see it even better if you take a, a pan of warm water and illuminate from a shallow angle from this side and this side. Then the, the patterns show up beautifully with nothing, nothing else needed. You can see them easily with your naked eye. Uh, and, and so the suggestion is, well, there is some kind of organization that's here, definitely. And we decided to look into this organization using an infrared camera. So we put the camera on top, and the camera, the infrared camera was pointed downward. And you know, usually the interpretation of the patterns that you see from one of these so-called thermal cameras are temperature differences. And, and so this is the pattern that we saw with the in, infrared camera. And this is dark over here, and this is light. So the usual interpretation is given by the chart that comes with the camera. And the white areas high up here have a higher temperature than the dark areas that are shown here. But we knew that this was not necessarily temperature because we could see it with our naked eye. It's some, some kind of difference in, in structure, but we couldn't tell exactly how or why. However, we had earlier done an experiment with Eugene Kishniak from uh, Pushino, and it, it showed um, an interesting effect that relates to the infrared image. So this is a, an infrared image of the EZ and water. So here's a piece of naphion, and here is water. And you can see the place where the exclusion zone is, is dark. And what does dark mean? Dark means it's not radiating very much infrared, whereas the ordinary water is radiating more infrared. And so when you see a dark region, the question is, with an infrared camera, um, is it possible that this dark region actually contains EZ water? So question is, is this material, does it somehow contain EZ, which doesn't radiate very much, and therefore looks like it's cooler? And that was the question. And the answer seems to be yes. We looked at this as it was forming. I'm not sure if you can see, but it consists of little dots. So little, these dots look like either, um, either droplets or bubbles. We couldn't tell which ones, but you could see that it consists of little droplets. And from earlier work that we've done, which is also in the book, I don't have time to, to discuss, um, we deduce that the patterns that you see um, in a droplet and in the bubble are rather similar, except that in the bubble you have gas here and you have liquid here with protons inside that are pushing out against membranes, multi-layers of EZ, and the EZ is what holds the contents in, and that's why it's round, that's why it's spherical, because of this shell, this EZ uh, shell. And so um, these, these, we call them vesicles because we never know whether they're droplets or bubbles. So the way the vesicles form is, is shown here. There's some kind of nucleator, which is a surface, uh, a hydrophilic surface of some sort, and that starts generating easy levels, which build this way and also this way out here. And if you remember, whenever you have EZ la uh, layers, which are negatively charged, you have corresponding protons out here. Now, once this starts forming, then you have a positive charge, negative charge. The negative is attracted to the positive, so the a negative charge begins to move in, in this direction. And this is the third panel showing additional growth and additional movement. And when you have enough of it, then it closes and you have a vesicle with positive charge inside and the EZ is negative. However, during this process, before it closes, these protons are repelling one another and so many of the protons escape. And when finally this closes to form the vesicle, it has a net negative charge. So this is important uh, for, for what, what follows. So you have a, a water vesicle. Again, it could be a bubble or a droplet, and, the, and they have net negative charge. And so if you um, think uh, of the concept that this contains easy water, a lot of easy water, and that's why it's darker. That's why it doesn't radiate as much as, as these regions. 
And if you remember, as this was building, we could see little vesicles that were forming. And so the structure we deduced looks something like that. It's a, a cluster of either droplets or bubbles. We think droplets, but it's not, not so clear, that are sticking to one another. Now, you wouldn't expect that negatively charged entities would actually stick to one another. What you'd expect is they want to be as far apart from one another as possible because they all have the same charge. However, um, there's a way that they can stick together, and this is, again, it's uh, articulated uh, in many places in, in the book, and, and they're actually glued by protons. So you have negative charge here, negative charge here, and protons in the middle that basically glue them together. And this is known, or it was, uh, co the term was coined by the great physicist Richard Feynman. He said, like likes like. That is, if you have two like charges, like two uh, negative charges, they like each other, you know, and if they like each other, they come together because when you like one another, it's a tendency. He said that like likes like because of an intermediate of unlikes. So he said that it's the opposite charge that gathers in between that pulls these together. So you'd think that they want to repel, but if you've got the positive charges in between, then they actually attract. And this doesn't violate any conventional laws of physics. In fact, it was demonstrated really nicely by Norio Ise from Japan, who won the top Japanese prize, which is dinner with the emperor and empress. And he put colloids in water. So you have a beaker of water, you throw the colloids in, and initially they're randomly uh, dispersed. But the protons that build, because the easy water builds around each one of these colloids, it brings these particles together. And, and so um, you can see one example from one of Issa's papers. Uh, these are colloidal particles, and initially, uh, at zero time, they're spread out randomly. In two hours, you can see that they're beginning to cluster, leaving spaces in between. And after four hours, they're clustering more, leaving bigger spaces in between. And finally, if you wait a day or so, that they come really close together and they form regular pattern that looks like this. This is magnified compared to the previous one, but they form what's called a colloid crystal, and it's regularly arrayed, and these negatively charged particles stick together because of the positive charges that lie in between. So like, likes like, because of an intermediate of unlike. And that may be the way, and this happens frequently throughout nature, and the book provides many examples. And we presume that the reason that these stick together is that as these EZs form, you have corresponding protons outside, and these protons can then glue them together. So this is what the warm water uh, looks like, and we think the dark lines arise from, from this. And if you look at this picture, uh, oh my goodness, the, <laughs> the colors really are off. This should be black and white. Anyway, what you can't see is the mosaic pattern is right here, and the pattern actually runs down. That part you can see. So the structures that in one plane look like a mosaic, they actually penetrate downward, and so, but you have tubes that are running down the water. And these tubes are not because of a temperature difference, because you can see this with your naked eye. Um, it has to do with a structural difference. And so the mosaic cells are mosaic tubes. And, and so you have a situation that is schematized here. Uh, this is the structure that's inside the water and it penetrates downward. The evaporative event is when a cluster of these, it needn't be all of them, it could be some of them, rise up. And if you were to take a cut through here, you get exactly what we see experimentally. So this is the way we see the process of evaporation. If you learned about evaporation, what you learned is that one molecule at a time gets a kick of kinetic energy and rises up out of the water. That doesn't agree with this experimental evidence at all. So basically, the vapor patterns that you can see by taking a cut through here come from the liquid patterns. And the droplets are clustering uh, into structures that look like this, but after it rises high enough, the droplets dissipate, 
And, you know, if you have your cup of coffee and you look, you can see this scattering pattern, but up high enough, you see nothing. And it means that these little droplets are spreading out and evaporating. And that kind of makes sense if you, if you think about humidity. So um, humidity uh, consists of, well, humidity consists of these little vesicles or aerosol droplets that are, are sitting in the air. And um, in clear air, you don't have those. And so if you think about looking at some distant building, and I always think of, because Nimoto is here, I think about Kyoto in the summertime. And if you try to look at something that's a kilometer distant, it's really hard to see. It becomes fuzzy. And because the humidity is so high, these little droplets scatter light. And because, because light is scattered, uh, some distant object becomes fuzzy. It's not clear as it would be in the case where there's little humidity. So, um, so we dealt with evaporation, which differs from what I think people think. Now, what makes clouds? So uh, what's, what's in the atmosphere? Well, there are many things in the atmosphere, and uh, water vesicles is one of those that make up the humidity. And the air is known to be positively charged, so somehow these positive charges are uh, clinging somehow to the air in ways that are not, not so clear. And so if you think about the formation of a cloud, the contents, what you need, you need these vesicles uh, to come together. Now they're dispersed throughout. You need them to come together. And the way they come together, as I've demonstrated to you, is by having positive charges. So if you add positive charges to, these, uh, to the humidity, then the positive charges will bring the vesicles together, and then you have a cloud. So, so it's the opposite of the process of evaporation, where where the, the vesicles are stuck together, and then they disperse. And then during cloud formation, with enough positive charges, they come back together, and they form something like this. So you get distinct clouds. So then the question arises, well, uh, what keeps the clouds suspended in the sky, right? Because this is heavy stuff. This is water. And you know that the water is pulled by gravitation. So there shouldn't be clouds in the sky, right? <laughs> Or should there? Um, so, a question that uh, I believe has, or an issue that has not been suggested uh, before is, uh, we know that clouds contain charge. And this is just one obvious example of cloud charge. And is it possible, somehow, that the charge that's in the cloud keeps, keeps the cloud up? Now, why would you imagine that the negative charge of the cloud would keep the cloud in the sky. Well, uh, so there's a, a feature of nature that I just became aware of about 10 years ago, and I think every Russian knows about it, but Americans don't know about it at all, and I don't know about the rest of the Europeans, and that is the negative charge of the Earth. So this came as a total shock to me, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, um, when um, a Russian fellow in the lab was telling me about the Earth's electric field, and I said, you must be talking about the magnetic field. He said, no, no, the electric field. I said, what are you talking about? I studied electrical engineering, and I never heard of an electric field. I never heard the earth was negatively charged. And then the next day, one of the students came with Feynman's lectures and pointed out that in volume two, chapter nine, the whole chapter is written about the earth's electric field and the negative charge of the Earth, and I was flabbergasted. So it looks something like this, and, and the size of the field at the surface of the Earth is about 100 volts per meter. So that means, as Feynman puts it, that for me, almost two meters tall, my nose is 200 volts positive compared to my toes. So I, that's a pretty big electric field. Um, and um, so, the hypothesis that um, we, we, we come up with is that it's the Earth's negative charge that repels the clouds, which also have negative charge, and that's what keeps the cloud in the sky. Now, your response is probably, ah, well, I don't know, our charge forces are pretty weak. Could that be enough to keep the cloud up in the sky? Um, so let me give you two examples to show that the charge forces are not weak at all, but much, much stronger than, than you think. 
Um, so here's one. You take a 120-watt old-fashioned light bulb, and you collect the electrons that flow through the filament for one second, and suppose theoretically you could cluster them into a point, and you do the same for another one, and you put one cluster on the ground, and the other one one meter up. So what's going to happen? Well, they repel each other, and this would have a tendency to go upward. And the question is, well, how much force do you have to put on this in order to keep it from going upward? Now, I don't know what, what you'd guess, and if I told it to you in Newtons, it probably wouldn't make much sense to you. So I'll do it in terms of garbage trucks, because <laughs> um, you're more... So it's 50,000 fully loaded garbage trucks would be necessary to balance the repulsive force between these two. That's how strong the repulsion is. And if that one is not enough to convince you, uh, take this one also from Feynman. Uh, and um, so you suspend uh, you and your partner. Somehow your partner is suspended. Um, it doesn't matter how, some springs or something, one meter above you. And then what you do is you remove 1% of the electrons from her body, making her positive, and you remove 1% of the electrons from his body, making him positive. And so, since both of these are positively charged, you have a repulsive force. And so, same question. Um, how much weight do you have to put on her back in order to prevent her from sailing off into the sky? Anybody guess? The weight of the Earth. Who said that? Uh, how did you know that? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, the weight of the earth. Now, I mean, this is... So, so we're talking huge forces, and, and, and so we come to, back to this. Um, how come the clouds are up in the sky? What keeps them suspended? And I would like to suggest that it's repulsion. So you may have noticed that sometimes clouds are low, sometimes they're high. And, you know, a very simple understanding is that this one is high because it contains more negative charge, and this one contains less negative charge. So since this has more, the repulsive force is greater, and this will keep going up until the point where the gravitation balances the electrostatic repulsion. So I think this is what keeps clouds in the sky. And also, it, it, you can explain then phenomena like this, which I think are unexplained otherwise. So you have three layers of clouds here. Sometimes I've seen even four and five. And you wonder, well, you know, how, how is this possible? The usual explanations have something to do with pressure and, and temperature, but it's not obvious how. So one idea uh, is that it's up here because this group of clouds has high negative charge and medium negative charge and low negative charge. And, and so, I mean, a side, side issue when you think about the fact that the Earth has negative charge and the atmosphere has positive charge, well, you know that plus and minus like to stick together, right? And, and, and so, is, could this be the reason why the atmosphere clings to the Earth, right? And you know that when the Earth spins, the atmosphere spins with it. Otherwise, we'd stand up and feel a fierce wind or something like what is it, 2,000 kilometers per hour or something like this? And another question that comes out of that is that does this cling force explain what we know as atmospheric pressure, right? The air is pulling down, pushing on us, and could it be that it's because the air is positive, the earth is negative, and they stick together? A simple alternative explanation. Okay, now what about what makes it rain? Uh, so what causes this to happen. And, and so the atmospheric scientists will talk about pressure, perhaps, and temperature, but I would like, as you know, to introduce the idea of charge. And so how can charge somehow determine whether it rains or whether it doesn't rain? Some of you, I, I think, know the phenomenon called induction or Faraday induction. This is actually very simple. So um, if you have, here's the ground, and here's a positive charge. This doesn't have to be the ground, it could be anything. If you have a positive charge and the positive charge is close enough, uh, then it will induce opposite charge here. And the closer it is, the more charge will be induced. 
And it's the same thing if you have a negative charge up here. If it's far away, then the force is really weak or negligible. But as the negative charge gets closer to this surface, then it begins to be more effective, and it generates opposite charge here, and, and so on, like this. And so the point is that when you have negative here and positive here, it forms an attractive force. So induction always attracts, you see. It never repels. And that explains, some of you have done this experiment before. It's good to show to kids, all right? You have a charged balloon, and you have a faucet, and you just move the charged balloon close by, and the faucet, the, the stream bends in this direction. And the reason it bends is, is that this balloon has been rubbed on your sweater or your hair, it becomes charged because of the friction and it induces opposite charge, and this is an attractive force. So, if we go back to this uh, and back to the principle that these will stick together if you have positive charge that is intermediate by the like-likes-like mechanism will bring it together into a cloud, but the cloud remains negatively charged because you don't need a lot of these positive charges to, to bring them together. And, and, and so when the cloud is uh, sufficiently low, when it gets low enough to the point where this negative charge then induces opposite charge here, then you have an attractive force. And the point is that that precipitation occurs, and it occurs inductively. And the evidence for that is that if you actually measure the speed of the falling rain, um, this is a paper, I'm sorry, I didn't include it. It was in Nature about eight or nine years ago, and people measured the actual speed of falling rain droplets. It turns out the actual speed was up to 10 times higher than the calculated speed if, if the droplet were simply falling by gravitation they concluded that there's got to be some force that's pulling the rain. It doesn't just drop from the cloud like the cloud unzips. And I would suggest to you that a possibility is that, um, that this is due to inductive charges that pull the rain from the cloud. Okay, so wind. Did you ever think of what causes the wind? A lot of people haven't, you know. You feel uh, a breeze. You know about the, the um, prevailing westerly winds up there. When you fly uh, from Seattle to Paris, it takes less time than if you fly from Paris to Seattle. There are winds, and then there are the trade winds going in the opposite direction. And there are gusts of wind. So why, why do we have wind? Um, again, I like to go back to, to charge. So... If you put a test charge here, this is the Earth, and this is the atmosphere, then you could measure the electric field that's above you. And it turns out from these measurements that the proton concentration diminishes with increasing altitude. So you have a big electric field here, and they have lower, lower, and lower. Um, and, and the field strength diminishes uh, <coughs> excuse me, as well. Now, so it turns out, um, that if you make measurements from nighttime to daytime, uh, you, you get pretty much the same effect, that, namely that in the daytime, when the light is hitting the earth, and particularly the water on, on the earth, you, the charges will go up pretty high compared to the nighttime. And this has been confirmed by actual electric field measurements, uh, which are taken from this source and just redrawn uh, by my son, the artist. And uh, So if you look, for example, at Africa and Europe as opposed to the Americas or Asia, Australia, you can see peaks occurring at different times. And so at 1400 uh, GMT, that's sort of where we are about an hour ago, you have the highest charge. It's just the middle of the afternoon when the sun has been beating down and creating evaporation and um, protons and vesicles ri rising up. And if you look, for example, the Americas, this occurs later, and it corresponds to the time uh, when uh, middle of the afternoon, uh, 1400, and, and so on. So it's staggered depending on where, whoops, where you are uh, on the Earth. And notice the magnitude uh, difference. This is what is it, about uh, seven or eight, and this is about almost 80. So it's a, a factor of 10 times. So if you measure the charge up there, during the daylight, it's 10 times higher than at night. This is a big effect. Um, and, and 
So you have a situation that, that's like this. The electric field up, up high, here is high and here is low. And so you have a boundary between the two and there's a charge gradient, right? If you measure the charges up in the atmosphere here, they're gonna be high and here they're gonna be low. And, and you have a lateral gradient actually here too on this side and this side. And, and so what do you expect in a, a gradient like that? This is just illustrative. You got positive charges here, no charges here. So what are these positive charges gonna do? They repel each other and that drives these charges which are somehow linked to the air in this direction and so you'll get flow, that's wind. And because you have two junctions, uh, two boundaries between light and dark, you should get one wind going west and one wind going east. And as we know, the trade winds, which are uh, weaker, uh, a low level, occur, they're called morning winds, and, and the jet stream, the prevailing westerlies are higher and of um, higher magnitude and power. So this is a suggestion about where the winds come from. And if you think about charges, then you might be able to explain a gust of wind, which are, is otherwise really hard to explain. You know, you're sitting there, there's nothing, and suddenly, whew, a gust comes. And I would suggest that a place to look for the origin of that gust of wind is in local charge gradients. Okay. So, um, uh, now, finally, we get to so-called weather exotica, but, um, but some of it's not so exotic, particularly where we live in, in Seattle. This is a typical wintertime picture. We get rain and clouds. It's gloomy. It's sort of like Amsterdam or something like that in, in, the, in the winter. And we get, of course, rain and people scampering around to, to get out of the rain. And if we go back to the, the paradigm that we've been talking about, humidity, and positive charge uh, gives, gives the cloud. So the question is, well, why is there more in the wintertime than the summertime? The summers are glorious in Seattle. Yeah, sunshine, dry, is very nice. And um, Okay, so when it's winter in Seattle, the earth is tilted, and so in the summer, in the southern hemisphere, it's summer. So you have a situation like this where, where uh, the sun is beating down mostly on the southern hemisphere, but not in the Seattle area so much. And then the consequence of that, uh, remember, when you have sunshine, you get a lot of high positive uh, charge. And so this positive charge wants to escape because positive charges don't like each other, so they want to move. So which way are they going to move? Well, they're going to move this way because that's the escape route. Meanwhile, the prevailing westerly is coming and mixes with this, and so the northwest where we live then gets the positive charge and the moisture that's evaporated from the ocean carried by the prevailing westerly. And that's just what you need to, to create rain, the humidity and the positive charge. And so the suggestion is that that positive charge then hits, hits the cloud, a high cloud, and as the cloud gains positivity, it not only gets bigger because it can attract more of these vesicles, but also it gets lower because it doesn't have as much negativity. Um, with all of the positive charge uh, arriving. And it gets lower and it gets still lower uh, as it keeps getting positive charge. And because of this positive charge, it's easy to glue clouds together. So you begin to have big clouds. It gets lower and lower. And when it reaches um, the critical point, um, then you have the, a large enough induction force to pull the droplets down and then you get rain. And so... Um, as long as this cloud gets low enough because of sufficient positivity, you should get rain. If it doesn't get low enough, then you don't get rain. And I think this is the deciding point. Um, so the rain is, as I said, pull to the earth. And so what about what's the decision point uh, as to whether you get rain or no rain? And um, I, I think uh, this is a hy hypothesis that the cloud must get um, enough lower past the critical point of inductive inevitability. You know, the force has to get large enough if the cloud gets low enough to pull the rain. So it's kind of like an orgasm. You know, you get just to the point and then it's either yes or no. So, uh, so the rain is, is pulled to the earth at 
um, velocity up to 10 times the calculated speed. Um, now, in the remaining five minutes or less, I think, uh, what about exotic uh, weather? So this is a, uh, a thunderhead that, that's uh, forming, and so you get thunderstorms, and when you get really huge storms, it may look something like this. And the question is, well, you know, how do you get something like this to form? This is a, quite an exotic pattern, which basically always occurs. And, you know, to start off, usually these systems go from, from here, the, the middle Atlantic, and they go westward. And if you have low cloud and you have trade winds that go in this direction, you can imagine that these are pushed in, in this direction. But why, why this swirling pattern? Well, one reason is that the Earth is spinning from west to east. And if it's spinning from west to east at the equator, it's, if you're standing here, you're going to be going at a hefty speed in this direction. If you're standing here, then the speed is extremely low. So there's a gradient of speed up in the atmosphere, and it's always faster closer to the equator. So if you have a cloud that's suspended up there, it's going to have a shear force, and it's going to begin to rotate in, in this direction. So now, if you take into account what I've just been telling you and, and this rotation, you could kind of imagine uh, how, how this might form. So you have um, a cloud, a bunch of clouds here with negative charge. They're moving in this direction, right? And this is pressing up against the positive charge that's uh, normally in, in the atmosphere and compressing it. So you're going to get a, a large attractive force between these positive charges and these negative charges, and remember, this is actually rotating, and these will begin to combine with one another, uh, and once this cloud in this region gets enough positive charge, uh, then what happens is it lowers, and it creates rain, and so you have this sort of neutral uh, or empty part of the cloud that's sitting right here, and this is rotating, right? And so this part is more or less neutral, and this part is negative. So this negative charge gets pulled, again, toward these positive charges, which sustains the rotation. And also, don't forget, we've just passed through this region here and sopped up the positive charge. So there's not much positivity here. There's a lot here. It keeps it moving in this direction. And as it keeps moving, it keeps rotating. And this region becomes the eye, eventually, because the eye is clear, it's rained, the cloud has rained out, and this will keep going to the point where you get a structure that looks like, like this. And so I think this is how, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, possible explanation of how these, these characteristic hurricanes or typhoons form. And then, you know, finally, you have this funnel that occurs in, in, in some places, and when you think about it, um, so the first thing is, well, this is spinning at a rapid rate. How does all this hold together? You know, you'd expect the centrifugal force is going to take the contents here and spew them in this direction. But remember, uh, most of the particles that are in here are negatively charged, and you've got positive charge to hold them together. So this is not exactly a solid, but all of these negatively charged particles are held together by the positive charges in between, and you have a like, likes, like, um, attraction that keeps those negatively charged particles together. And, and that's why if this thing is rotating, you can get huge winds at the edge of the tornado. And then, of course, you have all kinds of electrical phenomena going on here. You can actually see lightning strikes uh, throughout this. They're quite frequent. And so you can imagine that this inductive force that I talked about earlier is so strong uh, as to pull up refrigerators, which is what you actually see. Okay, so we go, go back to this weather cycle, and I've gone through um, uh, five or six of the events that occur throughout, and each one is different from what we were taught. The experimental evidence suggests that it's much different, and the central protagonist in all of this is charge. But when you hear the weather forecast, you'll never hear the word charge. It's as though it's a non-player. And I would suggest that charge might be the central player in, in all of this. And so the question I, I, I leave you with is, uh, you know, will charges the, or the recognition of charges help us to decide whether to bring an umbrella to work during the day or not? So I, there's much more information in the book that was, that was mentioned, and I would 
encourage you to take a look now that a movie is made. Though it means that everything in the book must be correct. <laughs> um, and I just want to mention before closing um, what I've been mentioning in the last couple of presentations about something that's not related to directly to what I just presented. It's called the Institute for Venture Science. This is our institute that we formed for pu funding promising ideas that challenge conventional thinking. And we've been able to get enough sort of seed money together to invite pre-proposals, which are now under review. And of course, we're looking for donations from people who, people of means who want to give back uh, something of what, what they've got. And there are many good reasons for doing it, which I'm happy to talk about. Here's the URL. And again, more information from, from the book. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for your presentation. Is there some questions? Uh, we have only a little of time. So, yeah. Uh, hi, Gerald. Uh, thanks for the, the great talk. Nice to see your ideas evolved uh, since last year. Uh, I have a quick question about the like, uh, likes, like idea. About the? The like, likes, like idea. Yeah. In, in principle, as you showed, this should lead to a crystalline formation, eventually. To a crystalline. crystalline. Yeah. yeah, eventually. Uh, and it, it, or, so I'm wondering, did you see any of that? Because a simple x-ray pattern should tell you whether it's there or not, and you should then see it in your evaporation as an experiment or in vapor droplets. And, uh, and if you don't see it, why? I'm just wondering, yeah. Yeah, the only, um, uh, first of all, I should say that there was a paper published about eight years ago um, in, in which this uh, crystalline structure uh, w was was shown in little spheres, uh, protein spheres that had water inside. They found a hexagonal sheet-like pattern uh, that, that uh, the authors are M-C-G-E-O-C-H and, and doubled. I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, their, their papers showed that. However, the only evidence of regularity that I know of in atmospheric, uh, there, there are two. Uh, and one of them is, is um, a rainbow, uh, you know, rainbows scatter light. And if you think about it, the only way that you could get this coherent scattering is if you had some kind of a grating with regular spacing. And so it looks as though it may be that the droplets that are in, in the mist or the rain that occurs around which is a rainbow are somehow ordered into... Uh, uh, a semi-crystalline state to give rise to the rainbow. Another, I had a slide, but I didn't have time to, to show. Sometimes when you're in a plane and you look down at the clouds, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you see that the clouds are organized into a row and a row and a row, and they're regularly spaced. And sometimes, if you're lucky, you can actually see that this row is made up of individual clouds. And if you look down, it looks like a grating, a two-dimensional uh, grating with little puffy clouds separated by fixed distances. I've never seen a, um, a, an explanation for that, but I can understand easily how that could be explained if each one of these clouds has the same negative charge and there are positive charges in between. Then you get something that looks as regular as the colloid crystal that I showed. The principle could be exactly the same, each cloud acting as a colloidal particle. So those are a couple of examples of the kind of regularity that you might expect from phenomena like that. Okay, only one question more, so. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I believe that the uh, human intention can affect the weather. And because uh, uh, personally, uh, there's a game called um, cloud erasing game, and we can intentionally erase you know, part of the cloud. I have experience. And also I believe that the collectively, the human intentions can affect the local weather or make it you know, unbalanced. What do you think about This is a uh, demonstration, the interaction between human intention and the fourth face of water. Well, I think so, too. I mean, I... I never heard of what you just said now, but it makes total sense. If you, it, you know, the easy water is a perfect substrate for storing information. It's a regular three-dimensional array in which the oxygens and hydrogens are arrayed in a regular pattern, just like in a computer memory, except that instead of silicon, here you have oxygen. And, 
and the oxygens can take on not two different states, like a zero and one, but actually five different states. The number of oxidation states is uh, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. So this is a, um, a, a, an exceptional, uh, potentially, at least theoretical, theoretically, an exceptional uh, information storage medium. And in the clouds, the clouds are full of easy water. So uh, if, if as, as you and your laboratory ha have shown, uh, information is stored on, I think it's in easy water, then I could imagine that uh, there's a, a, a physical basis uh, for understanding what you claim. Thank you. Thank you.